The second objective um, for lesson two is related to, to um, cognitive biases um, surrounding misperception. So how we're perceiving things in our environment and how we're, um, how we're understanding the world around us. Um, so the kind of the four main areas, we have confirmation and belief bias. We've got this uh, the ostrich effect, normalcy bias, and the mum effect. We've got the self-serving bias, illusory effect, and near exposure effect, and then the halo effect in the horns. And so these ones are, um, I mean, it's, it's that human tendency. It's the way that our brains have evolved. Like we have evolved to, you know, when our brains, um, you know, have a certain pattern set, like this is what I, this is what I believe. This is what I think. Um, when new information is coming to us from our environment, it's most likely that, so if we, you know, information comes in and it matches, right? It's that, um, it's that idea of match to sample, right? The information comes in, it matches, it supports, it's an agreement. Okay, you come in. Okay. Information comes in, it doesn't match, that gets discarded information comes in, it matches, we keep that. Information comes in, it doesn't match, it gets discarded or put somewhere else. So that confirmation bias, the belief by bias, when you, when you consider kind of the um, neurological or behavioral processes behind that, um, you know, when we, it's, again, it goes back to that idea of a match to sample like same keep it different go away same keep it different go away um and so as we are you know when we have thoughts we have feelings we have ideas we have these things that we believe at our core um it's common to to keep the keep the con confirmatory stuff and disregard the contradictory things However, this creates a situation in which we are potentially missing out on information that is important for us to consider so we can edit our beliefs, we can edit our thoughts, we can edit our decisions based on new information that's coming in that while it may contradict what we believed before, um, it's actually more accurate, more reflective of what is actually going on in the world around us. And so as behavioral scientists, we've been, been trained to, um, you know, we've been trained to accept and, and um, hold near and dear to our heart, this philosophical underpinning of hypo, um, a philosophical doubt, right? So we, we are supposed to, like, and, we're, and this is a skill that, we're, that, that we need to hone as humans, as the behavioral scientists, is always being in a constant state of philosophical doubt. So holding your, you know, holding your beliefs lightly, right? Holding your thoughts lightly, holding your urges lightly. Yes, this is the way it feels, and it feels really strong. It feels right. It feels real. But... <laughs> And a lot of information coming in confirms that. That might be due to like due to where you're looking, so that could that could be a problem as well. But when we when we look further out and we take into consideration information that is um, inconsistent with what our, what we believe, um, and use our you know our higher level cognitive processes to um, evaluate and consider and process and compare and contrast, um, and then decide and choose how that fits into the whole. We are again, turning off that automatic process and turning on that int intentional system and intentional process. You may still find that you, um, that that information can be discarded because it, it doesn't, 
truly fit into reality. But what is key is that you are taking that information into consideration. You're not just um, dismissing it at face value. When faced with challenges to our core beliefs or our thoughts, our decisions, et cetera, it can be common for us to um, stick our head in the sand. Like, I don't want to see it. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> I'm comfortable where I'm at. I like my normal and I don't want to know. Like, I don't want to know because if I open my eyes, if I actually look, then I'm going to have to really think about it and really have to reconsider what it is that I, you know, that I believe and that I think. Um, and so it's a, that common, you know, it goes back, it's related to that loss aversion where it's like, I'm, you know, you might lose your sense of self, your sense of identity if you, um, if you take this idea on board. And and so, you know, we stick our head in the sand, we um, avoid the things that are negative, we, you know, we um, try to, try to kind of sway our, kind of influence our own environment to, to um, stay kind of as it is, um, because change is hard. Um, and, you know, and things just continue to go on the way that they go on that urge. So if you can, you know, if you can hone the skills of getting, you know, getting present and being mindful about what you're thinking and saying and doing, um, it can, you know, help resist that urge to stick your head in the sand and really look right face the face, the dinosaur, turn towards the dinosaur and walk towards it. And I know this isn't going to feel good right now, but in the long run, it is likely to serve you and serve your purposes and serve your values so much better. And the same goes with the mom effect. Um, you know, we all see problems in our environments and it's, you know, it's hard to feel as though you're always like the squeaky wheel. Like see, you know, I see something, say something, see something, I see something, say something. I'm going to identify a problem. I'm going to make people aware that there's a problem. Um, that can be kind of, that can be something that we avoid doing because, you know, we don't want to rock the boat. We don't want to cause problems. We don't want to make more work for ourselves, you know, all of those things. And so, it's a common pattern of behavior to just kind of ignore or avoid or almost like poo poo something, right? It's like, eh, it's not that bad. It's not that big of a deal. And we're just going to let it go. Nobody's saying anything. It's just like, meh, let's just let it slide. But the problem with that is that when you consistently don't act when actions are needed, then all of those little things build up and you know this little piece of sand this speck of a problem right turns into two two specks three specks you know and then exponentially multiplies until you have a problem that is so much more um complex and uh convoluted and difficult to change and difficult to have an impact on. But had we, had we had a mechanism in place where we were, you know, talking about the challenges that we have and facing the reality of the situation and tackling the challenges that, that as they come along, those little challenges, you know, could have been dealt with and deflected more rapidly and not built, built up, which then, you know, when we have problems that fester and build up and we're not talking about the things that need to be talked about when we're not doing the things that need to be done, then we lose faith and confidence in ourselves and in the system and in, and in others. So being able to, you know, free the fear, let it go. I am okay. I am going to be able to step forward. I'm going to say something um, and address the challenges as they come up because I know that if I don't, it's just going to build up 
and be worse um, in the end. When we, I mean, the other, the other challenge that we have in organizations, in our lives, in our communities, in our um, families, is this idea that when we repeatedly say something or when we repeatedly hear something, it becomes, it becomes the truth of the matter. And so kind of on a, just a basic brain level, like information processing, information storage level, you can think about this as, you know, like, okay, so I, I've heard it once and I heard it from an authority figure, somebody that I trust. And so that's like, that's one connection, right? And then I heard it again from an associated um, authority or the same or the same one um but that's just like another okay another check another check in the box and then you hear it again right and these are these are neurons that i'm trying to represent here um so they like you know single connection i hear it again there's another connection third time fourth time fifth time right then you create this strong connection um in your brain that is that kind of that that thought that memory related to kind of whatever whatever piece of information that you, that you are hearing or seeing and when that happens often enough then it becomes to us it becomes the reality it becomes the truth just due to that mere exposure but the but the problem as as I'm sure that you can um, see and think about, reflect upon, is that just because something, you see something multiple times or just because you hear something multiple times doesn't mean that it's true. It doesn't mean that it shouldn't be questioned. It doesn't mean that it should just be accepted at face value. And so when you, um, when you find yourself like hearing the same thing over and over and having that urge to just believe it and accept it. And then, you know, and then possibly share that information with others as though it were the truth. Um, that's, those are the situations that when you, you know, when you um, identify that that's happening to become, you know, you're, once you become more aware of it, you can kind of self check. Let's question it. Let's, let's ask some questions. Let's not just accept it. Let's dig a little bit deeper um, to make sure that it's actually right, to make sure it's actually the truth. So you're not um, perpetuating myths. <clears throat> you're not per perpetuating illusions of truth um, that could potentially harm your reputation. It could harm outcomes. It could ha harm your business and your family and your bottom lines. <clears throat> Um, the uh, halo and horns effect is something that impacts us, especially when we are evaluating others, um, and we're you know we're evalu or we're evaluating a decision, we're evaluating people, we're evaluating performance, um, and this you know the the bias can create a situation in which we are, you know, evaluating things more positively on one side. So if we, um, you know, we think positively about a person in um, regard to one thing that they do, one characteristic or one um, skill that they're really good at, and we think positively about that, when asked to evaluate the other, you know, other aspects of their performance, if there's one really, really positive one, the rest of them are more likely to be rated as positive um, <clears throat> without necessarily having the evidence to support that evaluation. <laughs> and then conversely, on the, on the negative side, when you have a very strong negative 
a thought or opinion about a person or um, a characteristic or, or um, performance in one area, it, when you are asked to evaluate other areas of their performance, they're more likely to be rated lower even without confirmatory evidence of that. So as supervisors or as leaders or as you know, people who have the responsibility of oversight of people, this is a really important one to be aware of this tendency to you know, rate overly positive or rate overly negative in when you're evaluating things um, because, of, because of one positive association. And so again, just being, finding, finding ways to be aware of, um, of that, like when you're doing the evaluation, um, you know, possibly engaging in some mindful meditation to ensure that you're putting a check on that tendency. <clears throat> so the, um, the exercise for this objective is to consider a situation in which you've avoided an uncomfortable discussion and think about what that cost you um, in your life and also then um, think about what you could have done differently to overcome that avoidance uh, behavior. So for me, um, in my life, this, um, kind of the biases related to misperception are ones that have been frequently, um, have been frequently an issue for me. So, and, um, you know, because I've always, you know, I've, I've been, I've grown up and been a very independent person. I wasn't, I didn't really have anybody that I could count on or talk to. Um, you know, I've always been just, you know, more quiet and reserved and thoughtful and pensive and, you know, put a lot of time and effort into my, the decisions that I make, um, you know, overthink things greatly and, you know, put a lot of time and attention to make things like as perfect as they can be. Um, and I'm trying to learn to let that go, but it's hard. Um, <clears throat> but when we, you know, we're, uh, I make a lot of decisions on my own and I frequently, you know, rather than looking for information that is going to um, possibly help uh, improve my idea, even though it's contradictory, um, you know, I've often found myself only gathering information that supports my idea and my decision. So, you know, have a tendency to ignore negative or contradictory evidence, just like, okay, I'm not going, I'm, that is not in line with my beliefs. And so I'm just going to, again, deflect that and all the things that are in line with my beliefs and my thoughts, I'm going to um, bring that in and strengthen and essentially like self-reinforce. Um, and so, and then, you know, and then really just stick that strengthens the, the resolve that strength that, you know, tended to strengthen my decisions and my, um, to act, um, in the decisions that I made. Um, but what kind of, what would frequently happen is that, you know, when, people in my life would, whether, you know, be it a family member or um, a partner or uh, community members or um, colleagues, um, when discussing decisions or thoughts or, you know, things that I, um, that I had worked on and products that I had developed, um, it, my presentation when I talk about things would be in a very, um, you know, positive light and with all, you know, I've got this pretty little package for you to see and to share with you. Um, but even, you know, even though there might be other information that could have improved that decision or, or that plan in some way, I had a tendency 
to avoid those confrontations and avoid those conversations because they're really, really uncomfortable. And as I have worked over the past few years to develop and hone my psychological flexibility skills and my ability to, um, you know, stay in the moment, feel all the feelings, be present and just accept the pain for what it is and, and um, think about all the lessons that um, are there and be, you know, be grateful for those lessons that are being learned. Um, you know, I, I still have that tendency to have a, you know, that automatic fear-based physiological response, which is a, a deep, like it's a deep physical pain that I feel it's in my stomach. It's in my chest. It's in my throat. It's in my eyes. It's in my nose. That's, you know, I get, um, you know, stinging, stinging eyes that, you know, stinging nose, that feeling sense of wanting to cry, a tight chest, um, you know, racing thoughts. And so my tendency frequently has been to avoid conversations with others about my decisions because if I were to engage in a conversation with others about my decisions, I might come in contact with contradictory information. I might then have a, have a fear-based physiological response, which is going to make me want to like cry and run away. Um, which, you know, to me, it was like the ultimate, like absolutely no, no in the professional world. Like you do not cry. You do not show your emotions. You do not like, um, you do not demonstrate to others that you are not confident in your decision or that you might need to take into consideration other information. And because for me in my training and my leadership, that was not, that was not who I thought I was supposed to be. Um, I thought that I was supposed to be the one who made the decisions, confirmed them, thought them through, didn't, didn't have a conversation about them, didn't take into consideration any other evidence, but we were going to push forward. Um, and, and I avoided, actively, actively avoided those confrontations and conversations. And even in meetings would, you know, would talk about like how great things were over here. Um, and, you know, it's almost, almost as though just kind of like, glazing over the potential negatives we're highlighting focusing on all of the positives and you know almost putting a kibosh even even before they would you know have contradictory information kind of putting a kibosh on that and um, push forward anyway because if i had had those conversations if i had like actually had to you know, defend my decisions or consider alternative explanations or, you know, take in additional information and revise and edit my, um, my plan that could delay, um, action or it could, it could cause us like not to make any changes. And in kind of in my world and my, you know, in my view of how things were supposed to be, that was unacceptable. Like I, like things needed to change. We need to go. We got to do this. We got to get better. Blah, blah, blah. You know, we can't slow down. We can't stop. We can't, you know, we can't think about the negatives. We just got to keep going. Um, and look, you know, looking back on that, looking back on the, those tendencies to just kind of, you know, like not even perceive the negatives as there and just like not consider the risks that were present caused situations in which we would, as a team, charge forward, take action, do things that while they, you know, there was a, there was that short-term positive benefit, like it felt good and we did good and it was, you know, um, it was meaningful in the moment. It didn't necessarily produce the long-term change that we wanted because there, you know, we didn't always consider the actual, um, risks associated or those other negative factors.